Presented by Caltech. It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Peter Molnar, uh, Professor of Geological Sciences at the um, University of Boulder, University of Colorado in Boulder, and uh, Fellow of the CIRES Institute, which stands for Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Science. I learned today that Peter had a very, very interesting career, so he got uh, a a bachelor's degree in physics from Oberlin College, and then a PhD in seismology uh, from Columbia University. He then did um, a postdoc at Scripps, and then went to MIT, where he taught for uh, several years. Uh, and then he decided to take a break from teaching and focus more on research. Uh, so he was a postdoc for several years, and then he moved uh, in 2000 uh, to the uh, uh, CU. Uh, in Boulder. Um, so Peter has uh, uh, done a lot of outstanding uh, contributions to global tectonics. He is well known for having worked on problem on mantle convection, uh, um, uh, crustal deformation, and uh, uh, mountain uplift. And he's worked on problems related to climate tectonics interactions. And today he's going to talk about the growth of the Tibetan Plateau and the possible impact on the Asian uh, climate. Thank you. How do I advance this? What am I doing wrong? Yeah, that's what I thought, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, oh, there we go. Okay, I'm gonna talk about the role of Tibet. This is the Tibetan Plateau in the development of, of climate over Asia uh, over the past 10 to 15 million years. Start, I'm gonna give you an introduction to how the plateau has grown and then talk about climate. But there are two main points. The Tibetan Plateau reached its maximum elevation of roughly 6,000 meters 10 to 15 million years ago. This is a bit speculative, but note, this is 1,000 meters higher than it is today. We think it's come down some, time, some distance. And the second, the growth of Tibet has affected the surrounding climates, but in different ways and in particular, not much as an elevated heat source. This is the common idea that we've had for years. It's what drew me into this. I've been wrong now for 25 years. And it's what Bill was saying is not the way to look at things. And, and I think many of you are not trained in the solid earth, so I'm gonna be a bit elementary in this first part. Well, we can think of mountain ranges as being a bit like icebergs. You all know that when you see an iceberg, only 10% of the ice stands above the sea level. Most of the ice is buried. The same holds for mountain ranges in general. We have a crust that's less dense than the mantle underneath, and where you have high terrain, in many mountain ranges, you have a crustal root. Unlike the ice, where it's a 10 to 1 ratio, you see 10% of the ice, it's more like a 6 or 7 degree factor ratio of the height versus the, the, the excess thickness in the root. This is named for Airy, Sir George Airy, the astronomer royal in Britain in the middle of the 19th century. We have another version of isostasy, which is Archimedes' principle. You can imagine the density within the mantle, or the crust, <clears throat> varies laterally, and in particular because it might be hot. But in either case, it, it, if it's hot underneath here, it's thermally expanded, so the region will stand high. But there'll be some depth, some depth of compensation where the weight of the rock above, or if you like, the lithostatic pressure, pressure, just pressure to an atmospheric scientist, becomes constant at all depths. <clears throat> so I'm going to show you an animation that Tanya Atwater made years ago. First, we'll just run this. India, we have crust is the, is the light color. The hot color is mantle. Water is blue. Ocean water is blue in here. You've noticed that India has just moved north and plowed into Asia. There are a few things we know quite well. We know where India has lain at different times in the past. This is a map showing Tibetan Plateau today. India, and then the Indian continent, for instance, 69 million years ago, lay way down here, south of the equator. Here's the equator. And it's moved north steadily. Plotted here, the northeast corner, this corner, or the northwest corner in blue, the corner up in there, distance on this axis versus time going backwards 10, 20, 30, 40 million years ago. Very rapid convergence of India northward towards Asia, and then a slowing beginning around 40 or 50 million years ago when India collided with Asia by some definition of collision. All of this is in flux, 
I feel like my whole field is, is falling out from underneath me right now because everything we used to think is wrong and I'm going to avoid all those things that are wrong or I'm going to try to avoid all those things. Try, I think, is the operative word. So let's go back to this animation. I'm going to show you this a couple more times. First, the Himalaya. The Himalaya is formed by slices of the northern edge of India as India plunges beneath Eurasia. So this is Eurasia over in here. And watch this part of it. As I said, it's built by slices of the Indian crust thrust atop the Indian subcontinent. So if we run this, oh, that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, we run this forward, watch in here, a new fault will form, or another one will form, you build a high mountain range. And there are the Himalaya, right there, and all of this crust in here used to be part of India. That's all the Indian side, and that's been built over the last 40 or 50 million years. And we know that pretty well, I think. A, a modern, present-day cross-section drawn north-south, south on the left side over here, through the Himalaya, coming from stable India out here, crust, crust of 40 or 45 kilometers thick out in here, plunging beneath the Himalaya. Slices of the top part of the crust have been taken off to build the Himalaya, a slice from further north taken off earlier. You've had some melting to make some granite in here. And then these layers are meant to be folded up sedimentary rock deposited on the northern edge of India when you had a continental shelf. The green would be the last, the only remaining remnants of the ocean floor that lay between India and Asia. And then this, this red over here would be granite on the southern edge of, of old Asia, southern edge of Tibet today. OK, now let's do this again. This time, focus on Tibet over in here. This is going to grow into Tibet, this entire region. These lines mark faults that will become active. And what's going to happen is the crust is going to thicken in this, in this region. So we move into in, it collides. You start building the Himalaya. You thicken this crust. And then you build a high plateau back in here with thick crust underneath. The argument that I gave you before, uh, based on, on Aries' idea, this picture right here, you've thickened the crust, so you have a high plateau lying above. And we think that airy isostasy accounts for high terrain in most mountain belts, like Tibet, most of Tibet, but I'll argue not entirely, the Altiplano, the high central part of the, of the, uh, of the central Andes in South America, but Pratt isostasy, where you have a hot upper mantle, this accounts for the depth of the sea floor, a wide area of the world, of course, uh, why East Africa is high, why the Basin and Range in Nevada, Western United States, why it's high, and maybe even the Southern Rockies over in here. Now, one more part of this that's important and easily comprehended, I think, by atmospheric scientists is if you plot pressure, lithostatic pressure, this is the weight of the rock per unit area going down, of course, it increases. The slope in here depends on the density of the rock, so it's a gentler slope when you go through crust, and then it increases. If you plot that under the lowlands over here, you get a curve like that. But if you go in where you have high terrain and you make the same plot, that would be the outer, the right-hand line over here. Well, by the time you get to sea level, you already have a high pressure. The rock is, you've got a lot of rock on top of you. And this increases until you get to the depth of compensation over here. And then they're equal. But you have a difference. So you have a pressure gradient, a difference in pressure between the lowlands and the highlands over here. And just translating that simply, if you've got a pressure gradient, if you integrate that over depth, the difference will give you a force per unit length length coming out of the board in here. So this is, you've done work to raise, the, raise this high terrain, but you have a force per unit length that you've added to the system by thickening that crust. And that can do work in other ways. Well, I've, I've given you this simple image of how the plateau is built. So what's happening now? OK, this is a, a, a if we want to know what's happening now, we look at earthquakes. Earthquakes are a very, very simple way of seeing what's going on. So each of these symbols marks the location of an earthquake that has been studied quite thoroughly. And for those of you who know these symbols, I won't explain them. But those of you who don't, just think of it this way. The blue ones show what we call normal faulting down here. That's when two blocks of crust move apart, and the upper block on a dipping fault moves down. So the result is you thin the crust when you have this kind of faulting. And that's what we see throughout much of Tibet. On the flanks, such as along the Himalaya out in here, or on the northern flank up in here in the Chilianchan, the opposite takes place. You have horizontal convergence of crust. And if you have a dipping fault, the fault that's on the upper side moves up and over the other one, or alternatively, the one on the lower side moves down and under. So that's what's happening in the surroundings out in here. We also have what's called strike-slip faulting, where the fault plane is vertical and one side moves past the other. 
the normal and strike slip faulting in here are consistent with one another in that both show east-west extension. The normal faulting shows crustal thinning. The strike slip faulting, the black ones in here, show a north-south compression. So we have a bit of both. The important feature to notice in here, though, is that if you plot these as a function of the elevation, and we have two exceptions that prove the rule, that all of the ones showing normal faulting are at high altitudes, where the plateau is high, and the ones showing thrust faulting on the margins, they're all in the surrounding low areas. What this is telling us is that the high region is spreading apart, and it's also spreading on to the lower surrounding region. You're spreading out, the plateau is spreading out onto the Indian plate down here, spreading out to the north, while it's expanding in its area and contracting in its thickness. So we have a simple image of what's going on. <laughs> Tibet is merely a piece, a humongous piece of camembert, and if you prefer, it can be brie, a cheese that you put on the Indian plate, it's spreading out onto the Indian plate. As, it's, as you ripen it, it thins and spreads out. It's really little more than that. Now, the important fact here for all of you, however, is that you don't build a plateau the way you let a piece of camembert spread out. That's the opposite. You build a plateau by thickening up the camembert or thickening up Tibet. So this is telling you that some change must have taken place, some profound change, because this is almost the opposite of the processes that have built Tibet. Processes, processes building Tibet have contracted the horizontal dimension across here and thickened the crust. Now we have the opposite, an expansion and a thinning of the crust. So, okay, this is the speculative part of this. This is what some of us think uh, is going on. Imagine you have a crust which is less dense than the mantle underneath. The mantle extends down to some depth. The top of the mantle, the mantle lithosphere, is cold, colder than the, the underlying material. It's therefore denser, or it, if it's put at the same pressure, denser than the underlying material, and it's much stronger as well. So you have crust overlying mantle lithosphere overlying a asthenosphere, asthenosphere is weak. You thicken the crust horizontally, you build a mountain range, you create a crustal root, but you also have to thicken this mantle lithosphere underneath. So you thicken it, but it's higher density than the surrounding material, and that's what you need to get an instability to grow. This is intrinsically in in unstable insofar as this is denser than the underlying material. Well, here's your perturbation to make that instability grow. So let's let it grow and go away. We imagine that this dense material disappears. So the blue, this light blue is showing you material that's now gone. This is like taking the load out of a ship. The ship will rise. The surface should go up because you removed a weight on the bottom, you removed the keel on the bottom of a ship, if you like. Surface will rise. Crust mantle interface will rise a little bit. Not a lot, I'm talking 1,000 meters here, not 5,000 like the height of Tibet. And what this does, by raising this whole surface, you put potential energy, gravitational potential, potential energy into this system. The same, it's available to do work. It's the same concept that Lorenz uh, gave to the atmosphere in 1955, long before we solid Earth folks realized what was going on. And that available potential energy when the surface rises can then power an outward growth of the plateau. You can imagine the pl plateau growing wider by thrusting out on its margins and extending in the middle. This is the image that I'd like to plant in your mind, although I should emphasize that we are only a small number of people in the world who think this is actually what happened. Okay, I'm gonna run this one last time, and this time um, uh, watch the mantle lithosphere under Tibet in here. And I should point out that, that this was made by Tanya Atwater. She did this for my 60th birthday, and therefore it honors my prejudices, but it, not necessarily all the facts. That's what I meant by, whoop, that's not what I wanted to do. That's what I meant by uh, not everybody agreeing. So India plows in, you thicken the crust, you thicken the mantle lithosphere, a blob drops off, and you suddenly have very hot upper mantle right in contact with the crust, or at least at shallow depths and you have a gradient in the thickness of the crust as well in here. So in this picture where you've thickened crust and mantle lithosphere, removed mantle lithosphere, the surface went up, and then you've spread everything out, what, how would we test that? Well, we should have geophysical evidence for a hot uppermost mantle. We do, that's easy to show, I'm not going to. Enhanced volcanism, when you, when you thin this cold layer, you bring hot material closer to the surface, you enhance the opportunity for rock to melt, so you expect volcanism, an outward growth of the range, the thrusting on the margins here. You'd expect the thinning of the plateau, the high region in here would thin, 
And then you'd expect an increase in surface elevation in this phase back in here. And let me say, this is the one part of all of this that we haven't successfully tested. There are those who say this didn't happen, and I simply say their data are not very good. So volcanism, just a photograph, all this black rock is basalt capping all the high terrain in here in, in, uh, in northern Tibet. No problem finding basalt, basaltic volcanism up there. You can't digest this slide. The point here is to show that many people, all these authors, have shown when there's a change in the style of deformation, the Tian Shan suddenly grew rapidly beginning sometime around 10 million years ago. The Gobi Altai, maybe a little more recently, Lake Baikal started to open 10 to 7 million years ago, working all the way around the Shillong Plateau is young, 14 to 8. Folding of the Indian Ocean floor around 8. All around here, there's been a big change in the style of deformation inferred from a spectrum of, of observations beginning somewhere around 10 to 15 million years ago. Well, some of them are a little bit younger, but of that order. Then if we look at Tibet itself, we have these regions where you have normal faulting grobbins in geologic terms. And these have been dated over the past few years. Almost everything, I think everything in fact, almost everything in the 20th century, there's an exception. Uh, and all of these again are in the same range, 14, 10 to 6, 13 and a half, 7 to 5, 8, and so forth. All in the range of roughly 10 million years ago. This is when the extension of the plateau began. If we take, we can measure that present day extension of Tibet, across, across Tibet, the, the extension, and we can measure with GPS, we can measure the crustal thinning of Tibet, assuming conservation of mass. If we take that rate, the present day extension rate, extrapolate it back 10 or 15 million years, that's how we get a drop of 1,000 meters. The mean elevation of Tibet has come down 1,000 meters. I'm not gonna talk about what would have, what the world would have been like with a plateau a thousand meters higher than today, but paleoclimatically it might have been important. Since everything we used to think about Tibet's climate history is proven to be somewhere between not right and wrong, um, I'm not ready to go there. Okay, but to summarize, mantle lithosphere between northern and Tibet, beneath northern Tibet was removed sometime in this 15 to 10 million years ago. The surface rose, the outward force per unit length increased, folding up mountain ranges like the Tian Shan, the Chilean Shan, Eastern Tibet, the uh, uh, Shillong Plateau, and, uh, and all around the edges. And the surface subsequently dropped roughly 1,000 meters. Okay, here's a summary now of, on the, on the 10 million year, 20 million year time scale climate change. All of these show time series. All of these plots are time series of different kinds. In all cases, the right-hand side is the present. Then you go back 5, 10, 15, 20 million years when you can. Sometimes you don't go back that far. I'm going to focus on two areas and then move to a third with a different point of view. First, the areas of Luss deposition. Luss is windblown dust. If you go to the western edge, you've had deposits of windblown dust going back more than 20 million years, present 5, 10, 15, 20, back more than 20 million years of windblown dust. The big increase in here is associated with ice ages. When you had ice ages, both the earth cooled, became drier and stormier, so you, probably stormier, so you kicked up a lot of dust at that time. If you move on to the Lys Plateau over in this area, all the places that have been studied, and there are more than what I show you here, the Lys deposition began about 10 million years ago. So 10 million years ago, an increase in Lys deposition, not very far from Tibet, needless to say, we would like to associate them in some way or another. Well, what happens? How do you get Lys? First, you need to have big storms. You've got to have very strong winds to get the dust out, off the ground and up into the atmosphere before you can take it anywhere. So big storms like this, and they come in the spring. This is a plot showing you monthly, monthly values of strong winds on this and cold, uh, sorry, and dust outbreaks shown uh, in the bars in here for two different time periods. The white and black are just different time periods. And what you see is January, February, March, suddenly you get a big increase, April, even more, May, and then it dies back down again. The big time of activity is March, April, and May. This is work from Gerard Rowe uh, several years ago. Plotted, let's start with this plot up here. This is a plot of temperature at 850 millibars, roughly two kilometers up in the atmosphere. Uh, blue is cold, minus 10 degrees, minus 20, oh, sorry, minus 10, minus 15, maybe minus 20 degrees C in March, April, and May, springtime. 
Blue is cold in the north. It gets warmer as you go south. No surprise here. This is an outline of Tibet, an outline of Mongolia. Japan's over here. And what Gerard has done is he's plotted for six big dust storms over the past 50 years, more than 50 years. And what happens in the big dust storms is you get big cold outbreaks coming out of the Arctic, coming across Siberia, moving into Asia. So you see this big cold area. You normally, normal climatology, cold is way up here, way further south, moving out, moving out over Mongolia, over in here. Big cold outbreaks. And the logic here is that one has these cold outbreaks then moving over the mountains and you get Lee cyclogenesis. So the, the, there's, there's already a cyclonic flow at the cold front coming in. It goes over high terrain and then when the air moves down over lower terrain, the column of air stretches out. So you can look at this. This is the ice skater with her arms spread wide and she moves down over the lowlands, pulls her arms in. Of course, she spins faster. When she spins faster, the winds are higher. You can pick up the dust when that happens. So how does Tibet figure in this? Here, you have least cyclogenesis up here in the Mongolian Altai, behind the Mongolian Altai, behind the Gobi Altai, maybe behind the Hangai. The Lus Plateau is over here. Tibet's over there. It's not easy to say that Tibet's really relevant. So maybe it's not. Relationship of list deposition over northern North China to the Tibetan Plateau and its growth. The first explanation is there's none at all. Now, I was and spent most of my life as solid earth geophysicist, so I'm not going to quit. <laughs> uh, remember, when you raise the plateau, you increase the force per unit length that it's applying outwards. Remember, the, if you integrate down pressure down the lowlands, pressure's lower than it is beneath the high area, even if it's made high because it's hot. So you, the red is showing you the force per unit length that you get. So if we raise Tibet 10 or 15 million years ago, we increase the pressure, force per unit length, the Tibet applied further north. So maybe Tibet's connected to this list deposition geodynamically, a rise of Tibet, increase the lithostatic pressure, or strictly the force per unit length, that its lithosphere applies to Asian lithosphere farther north, which caused the Mongolian Altai and Gobi Altai to rise, and maybe a lysic cyclogenesis became possible. And so for this, I coined a new term. The rise of the Mongolian Altai and Gobi Altai are geodynamic teleconnections <laughs> from Tibet. One should never give up. Okay, now I'd like to turn to the Beloides story over here. Beloides for years has been our Rosetta Stone for the history of the monsoon in Asia over the last 10 to 15 million years. And it may still be the Rosetta Stone. The problem is we thought it was written in hieroglyphics and it turns out it's probably in linear B or some other incomprehensible language. And I'll make that clearer, I hope, in a second. So I, I took this figure to show you what's wrong and because it was better for me to blame myself than anybody else, but this is what Bill was saying was wrong earlier. The old view has been that you have sensible heating over Tibet. That sensible heat, because Tibet's high, gets heat coming in from the sun, so the, the air temperature here is much greater than it is at the same elevation out there. So you have, a, you have um, ascent over here, draws moist air in, condense, precipitate, and you get this cross equatorial circulation. And it would follow that if you raise Tibet a bit, you would enhance this process. This has been the logic that we've had. And what happens with, in the data I'm going to use, the Beloides, the key are winds. So this is a, a sequence of plots showing February winds, strong winds, but blowing to the southwest off the coast of Arabia, uh, sorry, coast of uh, Somalia. This is Somalia, Arabia, here's India up in here. You move into May, the wind's direction has changed, mo moving more towards India. By August, you have very strong winds up in here with, with uh, air blowing across the equator and towards India, but then by November, it's died down and the winds are blowing back the other way. Now, those are important because of this fellow here. This is, uh, I don't know if this is a senor or senora, uh, <laughs> Globigerina Beloides, but uh, he or she um, is not very big but is crucial in this business. This is a plot now uh, of days. G number one over here, for which there are no data, would be January 1st, 1986, from sediment traps in the Indian Ocean, collecting Beloides, measured in the number per unit, squ per square meter per day, deposited down in here. 
This is around uh, July, and here suddenly Beloides skyrockets, drops down, vanishes pretty much for the winter, and then goes back up again in the next monsoon season. And the logic is Global Gerani Beloides, the vast majority of these guys live at, at high latitudes where it's cold, it likes cold water, but it likes cold water also in the monsoon region when nutrients are brought up with it. So this has been forever our measure of, of um, the strength of the monsoon not just on the, on the 10 million year time scale, but on the, on the uh, Holocene time scale, on the Paleo time scale in a lot of ways. And so here we plotted going down 0, 5, 10, 15 million years ago, uh, and the age, uh, sorry, the percentage of Globo Geronibaloides at this ocean drilling project site in the Arabian Sea, and you see this big increase around eight or nine million years ago. This is work goes back more than 20 years by Crone and colleagues, by Warren Prell and colleagues. This is classic work. The age probably has shifted back a little bit, maybe a million years. So with modern timescales, it would be a little bit older. But anyway, you see this big strengthening. And of course, we all thought this was due to strengthening of the monsoon. OK, well, ideas have changed. Uh, first of all, this is the upper troposphere temperature. Bill showed a picture similar to this. This is from Bill's work. Uh, uh, and if Tibet were really crucial, you'd expect the upper troposphere to be hottest over Tibet, and it's not. It's hottest over northern India. So there's something a little bit wrong with the picture. Bill showed you this picture, where he emphasized moist static energy. Uh, the plot really is something else, but let's not worry about that. He went through this in quite a bit of detail about how the, the uh, monsoon forms where, or the maximum ascent forms where the moist static energy near the surface is, is at a maximum. You have ascent cross equatorial circulation in the two ways. And he showed data in, in this paper uh, consistent with that. The red line, think of this as moist static energy. It reaches a maximum at about 25 degrees north in the monsoon. The blue is the rainfall. It's slightly equatorward, as theory would predict. So this is the image that we have now of the monsoon with the idea that the moist static energy, the moist static energy at the surface, is really the key parameter that describes the state of the monsoon. And another one of Bill's papers from earlier, a plot of moist static energy. It's not really moist static energy, but if you linear, linearize that, you can get this. And it's easier to think of this as the sum of the internal energy, uh, heat capacitive constant pressure times temperature plus latent heat vaporization times, let's think of this as the concentration of water vapor in the atmosphere plus potential energy. When you're low, of course, that's, that's zero. It's a, it's a potential energy per unit mass, of course. The maximum is not over Tibet by any means at all. It's south over India. So this, this is beginning to cast some doubt about, about Tibet's role. And then Bill later on did this work with Juming Kuang, uh, where they ran a general circulation model with three conditions. So these are three, three runs. Each row comprises a, a, the results of a, of a single run. The top one with modern topography being atmospheric scientists, Tibet is defined by some pressure surface up here, not by an elevation, but it's still, you can all recognize it up here. One with no elevation, still coastlines, and then one with the same present day elevation distribution, except no Tibetan plateau, just a Himalaya down in here. And remember that theory says that the upper troposphere temperature, this is the upper troposphere temperature, way up between, between what, eight and, eight and 14 kilometers or so, in, uh, up in the atmosphere, the, the maximum there should overlie the maximum in the moist static energy down here. And you can see this maximum does pretty well overlie the maximum there. This, in fact, does pretty well overlying the maximum. But notice this is quite a bit farther south. That maximum, the center is over the Bay of Bengal down here, which is down here. So this is much further north. But the, the case where you have no Tibetan plateau is not very different from the case where you do have a Tibetan plateau. There's a, there's a bit of a difference, but not a very important difference. And so, and the rainfall is shown over on the right, and the rainfall is consistent. The rainfall w without Tibet and with Tibet is pretty much the same, but when you don't have topography at all, it's quite different. Okay, what is this, what is this telling us? Well, the, the feature that I want you to really focus on is, is more subtle. Notice the gradient in moist static energy, very low up in here, and then a very steep gradient before it gets high up in here. The same thing down here, very low, and then steep gradient to where it gets high, whereas you have a very gradual gradient coming across where the moist static energy here is reaching its maximum over peninsular India, way to the south over in here. What's going on? 
what's going on here is that the cold, dry air from the northern area is getting across without any trouble, and it's mixing with the hot, wet air, hot, moist air that's coming off the Bay of Bengal in here. So you're diluting this hot, wet air. So the, the role that Tibet plays, how does Tibet affect the South Asian monsoon? Tibet blocks flow of a cold, dry air, that is, with low moist static energy. It can be either cold, or it can be dry, or both. That's the air in the north. It blocks that, it prevents that air, cold, dry air, from mixing with the hot, moist air that forms over India down here. It's very simple, it, it's, uh, I, it's, it's beautiful stuff, and it all rests on very good theory that had been done by others in the past. But then it poses the question, Tibet, is it necessary at all? Do we even need a Tibetan plateau for this? Well, I'm gonna digress briefly for, uh, on the modern climate. We can look at this, we can, does Tibet, heating over Tibet matter for the monsoon? We can correlate moist static energy over Tibet with monsoon rainfall over India, correlating this quantity, temperature, uh, specific humidity, the concentration of water vapor, um, with rainfall over India, and that's what we've done for three parts of the monsoon. The early season, the main monsoon season, and the late season. Positive correlations are in red, negative correlations are in blue. We're correlating moist static energy over Tibet with rainfall over India. And you can see in the early season there is a correlation. In the main season, there's not much of a correlation. None of this is statistically significant, as I recall. You'd have to get above 0.2 for it to be statistically significant. In the late season, you do have a correlation. So there's a hint, uh, in, as far as this test is concerned, there's mild success, but only in the early, early and late seasons. So maybe Tibet shouldn't be ignored, but it doesn't seem to be very important. Okay, well let's go back to Beloides. Um, Beloides back in here, this picture, that, this goes back to Crone and his colleagues and Warren Prell and his colleagues. The drill hole that this is taken from is on what's called the Owen Ridge, this feature that's coming up right through here. Oh boy, I am going too slowly. Um, oh. So the Owen Ridge, this is, it was drilled into here. You can see all this sedimentary rock is tilted, and you can see channels cut into it. In fact, Owen Ridge, 10 million years ago, wasn't there, it appears. The, the Indus fan water came out here, poured all over, just crossed through here. There was no Owen Ridge. It emerged around eight million years ago, and it's been there pretty much since three to six. What happens when you have deep water? Remember, Globigerina beloides is calcium carbonate. It's a calcite. When it, uh, when it um, is deposited at shallow water, it stays there with no problem, but when it goes to deep water, it dissolves. This, the dissolution of calcium carbonate increases precipitously in the deeper part of the ocean. This blue line is the accumulation rate for, cal for calcite, like Globigerina beloides, and you get deep enough and you get zilch, nothing down there at all. So we have this big increase going forward in time from 14 million years ago to eight or nine, hardly any Globigerina beloides, and a big step up, big increase at that time that we thought was the monsoon, but the CCD, the, uh, the Owen Ridge, rose above the calcite carbonate compensation depth at about that time. What does that mean? Well, that means before eight to nine million years ago, most of global geronium beloides dissolved, never got deposited, or dissolved as it was sitting on the floor before it could uh, be buried. And, but since eight to nine million years ago, they avoided dissolution. So I've spent 25 years with this being one of the big motivations and Clearly I've wasted my time and to some degree. <laughs> Beloides is telling us nothing. So can we get anything? Can Tibet do anything for us? And here I'm gonna turn and, and make a case that it can. Tibet is useful for understanding some aspect of the monsoon. I wanna concentrate in this area where there aren't time series, but there's good evidence of a change. The vertebrate paleontologists have known for, for decades that in this area before about 10 million years ago, the animals were browsers. They ate leaves off of trees. They ate fruits off of trees. And then since roughly 10 or maybe a little more recently, seven million years ago, they became grazers. They ate grass. So you had a transition from forest dwelling to grassland dwelling vertebrates. And this applies not only to big animals, but to small animals. At the same time, it looks like Eastern Tibet rose. I, I'm the same you know, compilation of lots of dates. These are particularly important, but um, I'm not gonna tell you how, 
just say that they point towards uh, eastern Tibet rising in the last 10 million years. And going back to Bu Sun Kuang, uh, this is a, a plot, this is a difference between, in rainfall between when you have a Himalaya without Tibet and then taking from that Himalaya with Tibet. So this blue is telling you that it rains in eastern Tibet when eastern Tibet is high. So you can see where I'm going. I want to make eastern Tibet high. Then borrowing from a classic study by Rodwell and Hoskins, who asked a completely different question. They asked, why is the Mediterranean the Mediterranean climate? Why does it have a Mediterranean? Why does it not rain in summer? They said, well, it do doesn't rain in summer because you have heating over the Bay of Bengal, rapid ascent because of that heating. That sends Rossby waves westward. You have subsidence of the air, the air coming in from the west over the Mediterranean. That subsidence, the air as it subsides, it warms, it evaporates any of the moisture in the air and it leads to a transparent atmosphere so you get a warm summer and no rain over the Mediterranean. Well, let's just take that locus of ascent and move it up to northeastern Tibet, or eastern Tibet over in here. This is now a map. I'm not going to describe outgoing long wave, with long wave uh, radiation, but this is a map for July and August when it really rains over in this area. And the point is, notice the correlations, the, when it rains, over here, it doesn't rain over there, vice versa, when it's dry, dry over here, it is likely to be rainy here. The correlations aren't overwhelmingly large, but there is a correlation, a negative correlation between rainfall over eastern Tibet and over northwestern India. So the logic is eastern Tibet grew upward and outward since 10 million years ago, increased elevations, enhanced condensation and orographic precipitation there in eastern Tibet. Latent heating over eastern Tibet sent Rossby waves westward and induced descent over northwest India, northwest India and Pakistan, and descent of the dry air suppressed precipitation and led to an aridification of northwest India. That's aridification of this area because of a rise of that area. Okay, uh, this is my last one. How might the growth of Tibet affect Asian paleoclimate? Well, monsoon rainfall in general over India uh, weekly at best, and only in the early and late monsoon seasons. The Lys Plateau with dust, well, maybe it did, but only via geodynamic teleconnection, and rainfall or aridification over northwest India, maybe, and if so, via Rodwell and Hoskins mechanism, it's the Gill model, a teleconnection. But this means that the monsoon, in some loose sense, became weaker, not stronger, at 10 million years ago. And remember, from the Buloides, the old canonical view was that the monsoon became stronger 10 million years ago because of the increase in blue ladies. Thank you.